Story One of Stories of Ships and the Sea. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Stories of Ships and the Sea by Jack London. Story One Chris Farrington, Able Seaman. If your vase in der cold country ships, a little shaver like you would be only der boy, und you would wait on der table seaman, und when der able seaman sing out, boy, der water jug, you would jump quick, like a shot, und bring der water jug, und when der able seaman sing out, boy, my boots, you would get their boots, und you would be politeful, und say, yes, sir, und no, sir. But you pee in der American ship, and you think you are so good as der able seaman. Chris, mine boy, I have been a sailor man for twenty two years. Und do you think you are so good as me? I was a sailor man before you was born, and I not und reef und splice when you play mit top strings und fly kites. But you are unfair, Emil, cried Chris Farrington. His sensitive face flushed and hurt. He was a slender, though strongly built young fellow of seventeen, with Yankee ancestry writ large all over him. There you go once again, the Swedish sailor exploded. My name is Mr. Johansen, und a kid of a boy like you call me Emil. It was insulting, und comes because of der American ship. But you call me Chris, the boy expostulated. Reproachfully, but you was a boy. Who does a man's work? Chris retorted. And because I do a man's work, I have as much right to call you by your first name as you me. We are all equals in this forecastle, and you know it. When we signed for the voyage in San Francisco, we signed as sailors on the Sophie Sutherland, and there was no difference made with any of us. Haven't I always done my work? Did I ever shirk? Did you or any other man ever have to take a wheel for me, or a lookout, or go aloft? Chris is right, interrupted a young English sailor. No man has had to do a tap of his work yet. He signed as good as any of us, and he's shown himself as good. Better, broke in a Nova Scotia man, better than some of us. When we struck the sealing grounds, he turned out to be next to the best boat steerer aboard. Only French Louis, who'd been at it for years, could beat him. I'm only a boat puller, and you're only a boat puller too, Emil Johansen, for all your twenty two years at sea. Why don't you become a boat steerer? Too clumsy, laughed the Englishman, and too slow. Little that counts one way or the other, joined in Dane Jurgensen, coming to the aid of his Scandinavian brother. Emil is a man grown and an able seaman. The boy is neither. And so the argument raged back and forth, the Swedes, Norwegians, and Danes, because of race kinship, taking the part of Johansen, and the English, Canadians, and Americans taking the part of Chris. From an unprejudiced point of view, the right was on the side of Chris. As he had truly said, he did a man's work, and the same work that any of them did. But they were prejudiced, and badly so, and out of the words which passed rose a standard quarrel which divided the forecastle into two parties. The Sophie Sutherland was a seal hunter, registered out of San Francisco, and engaged in hunting the furry sea animals along the Japanese coast north to Bering Sea. The other vessels were two masted schooners, but she was a three master, and the largest in the fleet. In fact, she was a full-rigged, three-top-mast schooner, newly built. Although Chris Farrington knew that justice was with him, and that he performed all his work faithfully and well, many a time, in secret thought, he longed for some pressing emergency to arise, whereby he could demonstrate to the Scandinavian seamen that he also was an able seaman. But one stormy night, by an accident for which he was in no wise accountable, in overhauling a spare anchor chain, he had all the fingers of his left hand badly crushed, and his hopes were likewise crushed, 
for it was impossible for him to continue hunting with the boats, and he was forced to stay idly aboard while his fingers should heal. Yet, although he little dreamed it, this very accident was to give him the long-looked-for opportunity. One afternoon, in the latter part of May, the Sophie Sutherland rolled sluggishly in a breathless calm. The seals were abundant, the hunting good, and the boats were all away and out of sight. And with them was almost every man of the crew. Besides Chris, there remained only the captain, the sailing master, and the Chinese cook. The captain was captain only by courtesy. He was an old man, past eighty, and blissfully ignorant of the sea and its ways. But he was the owner of the vessel, and hence the honorable title. Of course, the sailing master, who was really captain, was a thorough-going seaman. The mate, whose post was aboard, was out with the boats, having temporarily taken Chris's place as boat steerer. When good weather and good sport came together, the boats were accustomed to range far and wide and often did not return to the schooner until long after dark. But for all that, it was a perfect hunting day. Chris noted a growing anxiety on the part of the sailing master. He paced the deck nervously, and was constantly sweeping the horizon with his marine glasses. Not a boat was in sight. As sunset arrived, he even sent Chris aloft to the mizzen topmast head, but with no better luck. The boats could not possibly be back before midnight. Since noon, the barometer had been falling with startling rapidity, and all the signs were ripe for a great storm. How great, not even the sailing master anticipated. He and Chris set to work to prepare for it. They put storm gaskets on the furled topsails, lowered and stowed the foresail and spanker, and took in the two inner jibs. In the one remaining jib they put a single reef and a single reef in the mainsail. Night had fallen before they finished, and with the darkness came the storm. A low moan swept over the sea, and the wind struck the Sophie Sutherland flat. But she righted quickly, and with the sailing master at the wheel, sheared her bow into within five points of the wind. Working as well as he could with his bandaged hand, and with the feeble aid of the Chinese cook, Chris went forward and backed the jib over to the weather side. This, with a flat mainsail, left the schooner hove to. "'God help the boats! It's no gale! It's a typhoon!' the sailing master shouted to Chris at eleven o'clock. "'Too much canvas! Got to get two more reefs into the mainsail, and got to do it right away!' He glanced at the old captain, shivering in oilskins at the binnacle and holding on for dear life. "'There's only you and I, Chris, and the cook, but he's next to worthless.' In order to make the reef, it was necessary to lower the mainsail, and the removal of this after-pressure was bound to make the schooner fall off before the wind and sea because of the forward pressure of the jib. "'Take the wheel!' the sailing master directed, and when I give the word, hard up with it, and when she's square before it, steady her, and keep her there. We'll heave to again as soon as I get the reefs in. Gripping the kicking spokes, Chris watched him and the reluctant cook go forward into the howling darkness. The Sophie Sutherland was plunging into the huge head seas and wallowing tremendously. The tense steel stays and taut rigging humming like harp strings to the wind. A buffeted cry came to his ears, and he felt the schooner's bow paying off of its own accord. The mainsail was down. He ran the wheel hard over, and kept anxious track of the changing direction of the wind on his face, and of the heave of the vessel. This was the crucial moment. In performing the evolution, she would have to pass broadside to the surge before she could get before it. The wind was blowing directly on his right cheek, when he felt the Sophie Sutherland lean over and begin to rise toward the sky, up, up, an infinite distance. Would she clear the crest of the gigantic wave? Again, by the feel of it, for he could see nothing, he knew that a wall of water was rearing and curving far above him along the whole weather side. There was an instant's calm as the liquid wall intervened and shut off the wind. The schooner righted, and for that instant seemed at perfect rest. Then she rolled to meet the descending rush. Chris shouted to the captain to hold tight, and prepared himself for the shock. But the man did not live who could face it. 
an ocean of water smote Chris's back, and his clutch on the spokes was loosened as if it were a baby's. Stunned, powerless, like a straw on the face of a torrent, he was swept onward he knew not whither. Missing the corner of the cabin, he was dashed forward along the poop runway a hundred feet or more, striking violently against the foot of the foremast. A second wave, crushing inboard, hurled him back the way he had come, and left him half drowned where the poop steps should have been. Bruised and bleeding, dimly conscious, he felt for the rail and dragged himself to his feet. Unless something could be done, he knew the last moment had come. As he faced the poop, the wind drove into his mouth with suffocating force. This brought him back to his senses with a start. The wind was blowing from dead aft. The schooner was out of the trough and before it. But the send of the sea was bound to breach her to again. Crawling up the runway, he managed to get to the wheel just in time to prevent this. The binnacle light was still burning. They were safe. That is, he and the schooner were safe. As to the welfare of his three companions, he could not say, nor did he dare leave the wheel in order to find out, for it took every second of his undivided attention to keep the vessel to her course. The least fraction of carelessness, and the heave of the sea under the quarter was liable to thrust her into the trough. So, a boy of one hundred and forty pounds, he clung to his Herculean task of guiding the two hundred straining tons of fabric amid the chaos of the great storm forces. Half an hour later, groaning and sobbing, the captain crawled to Chris's feet. All was lost, he whimpered. He was smitten unto death. The galley had gone by the board, the mainsail and running gear, the cook, everything. "'Where's the sailing-master?' Chris demanded, when he had caught his breath after steadying a wild lurch of the schooner. It was no child's play to steer a vessel under single-reefed jib before a typhoon. "'Clean up forward,' the old man replied, jammed under the foxhole head, but still breathing. Both his arms are broken, he says, and he doesn't know how many ribs. He's hurt bad. Well, he'll drown there the way she's shipping water through the hawse pipes. Go forward,' Chris commanded, taking charge of things as a matter of course. Tell him not to worry that I'm at the wheel. Help him as much as you can, and make him help. He stopped and ran the spokes to starboard as a tremendous billow rose under the stern and yawed the schooner to port. And make him help himself for the rest. Unship the foxhole hatch and get him down into a bunk. Then ship the hatch again. The captain turned his aged face forward and wavered pitifully. The waist of the ship was full of water to the bulwarks. He had just come through it, and knew death lurked every inch of the way. "'Go!' Chris shouted fiercely, and as the fear-stricken man started, "'And take another look for the cook!' Two hours later, almost dead from suffering, the captain returned. He had obeyed orders. The sailing-master was helpless, although safe in a bunk. The cook was gone." Chris sent the captain below to the cabin to change his clothes. After interminable hours of toil, day broke cold and gray. Chris looked about him. The Sophie Sutherland was racing before the typhoon like a thing possessed. There was no rain, but the wind whipped the spray of the sea-mast high, obscuring everything except in the immediate neighborhood. Two waves only could Chris see at a time, the one before and the one behind. So small and insignificant the schooner seemed on the long Pacific roll. Rushing up a maddening mountain, she would poise, like a cockle shell on the giddy summit, breathless and rolling, leap outward and down into the yawning chasm beneath, and bury herself in the smother of foam at the bottom. Then the recovery, another mountain, another sickening upward rush, another poise and the downward crash. Abreast of him, to starboard, like a ghost of the storm, Chris saw the cook dashing apace with the schooner. Evidently, when washed overboard, he had grasped and become entangled in a trailing halyard. For three hours more, alone with this gruesome companion, Chris held the Sophie Sutherland before the wind and sea. He had long since forgotten his mangled fingers. The bandages had been torn away, and the cold, salt spray had eaten into the half-healed wounds until they were numb and no longer pained. But he was not cold. The terrific labor of steering forced the perspiration from every pore. 
yet he was faint and weak with hunger and exhaustion, and hailed with delight the advent on deck of the captain who fed him all of a pound of cake chocolate. It strengthened him at once. He ordered the captain to cut the halyard by which the cook's body was towing, and also to go forward and cut loose the jib halyard and sheet. When he had done so, the jib fluttered a couple of moments like a handkerchief, then tore out of the bolt ropes and vanished. The Sophie Sutherland was running under bare poles. By noon the storm had spent itself, and by six in the evening the waves had died down sufficiently to let Chris leave the helm. It was almost hopeless to dream of the small boats weathering the typhoon, but there was always the chance in saving human life, and Chris at once applied himself to going back over the course along which he had fled. He managed to get a reef in one of the inner jibs and two reefs in the spanker, and then, with the aid of the watch tackle, to hoist them to the stiff breeze that yet blew. And all through the night, tacking back and forth on the back track, he shook out canvas as fast as the wind would permit. The injured sailing master had turned delirious, and between tending him and lending a hand with the ship, Chris kept the captain busy. Taught me more seamanship as he afterwards said, than I'd learned on the whole voyage. But by daybreak the old man's feeble frame succumbed, and he fell off into exhausted sleep on the weather poop. Chris, who could now lash the wheel, covered the tired man with blankets from below, and went fishing in the lazaretto for something to eat. But by the day following he found himself forced to give in, drowsing fitfully by the wheel, and waking ever and anon to take a look at things. On the afternoon of the third day, he picked up a schooner, dismasted and battered. As he approached, close hauled on the wind, he saw her decks crowded by an unusually large crew, and on sailing in closer, made out, among others, the faces of his missing comrades. And he was just in the nick of time, for they were fighting a losing fight at the pumps. An hour later, they, with the crew of the sinking craft, were aboard the Sophie Sutherland, Having wandered so far from their own vessel, they had taken refuge on the strange schooner just before the storm broke. She was a Canadian sealer on her first voyage, and, as was now apparent, her last. The captain of the Sophie Sutherland had a story to tell also, and he told it well. So well, in fact, that when all hands were gathered together on deck during the dog watch, Emil Johansen strode over to Chris and gripped him by the hand. Chris! he said, so loudly that all could hear, Chris, I give in. You fuss used so good a sailor man as I. You fuss a bully boy und able seaman, und I be proud for you. Und Chris, he turned as if he had forgotten something, and called back, From this time always you call me Emil mitout der mister. End of Story 1 Recording by William Tomko